Well, I want to welcome to the program, Layla Miller. Layla joins me. Layla, are you down in Arizona right now? I am. I'm in sunny Phoenix at the moment. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm in kind of chilly Spokane in the moment. So I'm a little jealous of you, but I'm not going to be jealous of you in a couple of months. Let me tell you, I think that the weather there, it shifts. <laughs> You're shaking your head. <laughs> the dry heat, Tom. It's a dry heat. The dry heat, 100, 100 degrees. That's, isn't an oven dry heat as well? Yes. Right? <laughs> and you can stand it for like maybe two seconds and then you want to get out of the oven. But we have a lot of air conditioning and swimming pools. So there's that. Well, and you have these misters. Yeah, I, I, mm -hmm. the, the oddest thing at restaurants and other places, these misty things that kind of spray a misty water on you. Uh, I, who uh, made that up? Whoever, yeah. whoever came up with that idea? Well, it only works in a dry heat. And I have a, a little granddaughter who was visiting me from um, Omaha and she was walking under the misters. And she's like, what are these? <laughs> she just had no idea these things existed, but it was very fascinating for her. So yeah, we're grateful for them. Yeah. Well, uh, Layla, I'm grateful for you. Uh, you are a, a wife and a mother. Now, how long have you been married? So this coming July will be 33 years. Nice. 33 years. So you're ahead of me by four years. This mm -hmm. August will be 29 years for my wife, Carrie, and me. And um, so you're going to have to tell me what the next four years are like. Okay. So <laughs> they're awesome. I have to say it gets better as you age and you start to realize we don't have that much time left even, you know, so that you start to really appreciate each other more. So yeah. yeah. Amen. Is, but isn't that, yeah, it's a, when you start asking yourself how much time that remains versus, Oh, look at where we're headed. That sort of open horizon of headed towards the future. Uh, are you familiar with those? Uh, there've been a couple of books on the second half uh, in the second half of life. Have you done any diving into those? I have not, no. Yeah. Well, the idea is that in the first half, we're all about achievement, conquering, kingdom building. In the second half, we're more focused on meaning and relationships and being together. And so there's that shift and that shift sort of happens in, in people's lives as they're like, you know what? I'm not going to I'm not going to be able to dunk the basketball anymore. I'm not going to go pro. I'm not going to be the CEO. I'm not going to achieve all the, the worldly kingdom things that were all there. But you know what? There are more important things than even those pursuits. And it's about relationships. It's about family. It's about being together well, stuff like that. Does that ring true for your life as you're kind of navigating this? I'm, I'm loving what you're saying. I really love what you're saying because that is actually exactly what's happening now. And um, I would love to read those books. So whatever you, you know, give me that info. Cause that's really fantastic. That is mirroring exactly what's happening in our lives. So yeah. um, you just don't think about it. Cause you think you have forever when you're younger. And then, you know, especially as, as Christians, you realize, okay, now this is really, this is real. We're not going to be here forever. And everything, even I, this is going to sound so corny because my husband and I are not corny people, but I just like just holding his hand sometimes now, I think I may not be able to hold his hand forever. I mean, I want, I want to really cherish it, not for, just for me, but for him to know that I want to, I, I want to be connected with him and, and, and I love him. I don't know. It's just, that's been recent. So, um, hang in there guys. Cause everyone thinks that marriage is really hard, but once you get past a lot of it, you realize this is profound. You know, I mean, I think it was like 25 years into our marriage and, um, a few of our, a couple of our kids had been married. I think we had some grandkids by then. And, uh, I remember turning to him, we're just driving down the street. And I just thought, and I looked at him, I said, you know, we've built a life. It just kind of hit me. How, we've built a life. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you don't really notice or think about that when you're young, you just think of, like you said, everything ahead of you, but it was a profound moment. I think that I won't forget. So. That's beautiful. Now, I, I'm going to say it's beautiful. It's corny. It is corny, but it's actually quite beautiful. My wife, I think she would appreciate it more. So I, that's I'm going to I'm going to kind of lead her, put her forward in that. That's actually no, I, I'm teasing. It's 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 profound and it's beautiful. It really is. And I think it speaks to something that's um, also deeply true about relationships flourishing. Right. So. Uh, it's. I think that that's an aspect that um, we today have to recover, where today I think a lot of folks that are very, very active and, and energized around uh, being involved in the life of the church, 
focus on the truths uh, or the teachings of the church. And that not a bad thing, right? But if we pay attention to our tradition, what is true is also good and beautiful. And, and what that means is that if we accept a teaching of the church as true, it's supposed to lead to human flourishing. That if we follow what is true, we're going to flourish. That means it's good. There's going to be a sense of overflow that comes into our life. And you know what? It's also going to be supremely attractive and radiant. It's beautiful. And so yeah. what you were talking about there is, I think, a profound truth in marriage. And you're showing what flourishing looks like and some of the beautiful aspects of, of living a married life that only manifest themselves over time. And I, so just thanks for sharing that. I, I just I love that you shared that poignant, uh, poignant uh, just story of holding your husband's hand. Yeah. And I've never even said it to him. So it's kind of interesting that I, you know, I spoke it out loud to everybody, but that was just in my consciousness, you know, recently I'm like, wow, this is a different, it's a shift. It's a shift of really, I don't know. It's that deep, profound appreciation for what you have. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah amen. I, I, my wife, Carrie and I were having coffee this morning and it's uh, some of our like very best conversations happen early in the morning when we're up before the kiddos, we still have five kids at home. And, um, when we're up first, she's like, goodness, why can't this be on the radio, this conversation right here or on the podcast, right? It's it's something that it's it's the easy conversation that happens when you're not crowded in uh, by the pressures and stresses of the day. Then you can have the more peaceful, enjoyable being together time. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's precious. Yeah. So Layla, I think that uh, you just shared something that in some ways is indicative of your own um, part of your mission being accomplished in this world by talking about critical issues, especially around marriage and family and raising kids that are connected to, guess what, the teachings of the church that are true. And how do we stand for them in a way that will also be good and beautiful when sometimes the teachings of the church themselves come under attack? But there are so many of us that can also uphold a teaching in our minds and profess it out loud. But when it comes to living it, it's harder. All of a sudden, the goodness of that truth and the beauty of that truth, we bump up against some real obstacles, some real roadblocks. And it it makes it all of a sudden quite complicated and painful sometimes to, to live the goodness and to see the beauty of what the church teaches and proposes is true. So, you know, I'll, I'll just stop right there. I mean, your, your, your life has recently, right, in the last couple, well, decades has been about upholding some of the, these fundamental teachings of the church around marriage and family and saying, hey, if this is true, then it also has to be good and beautiful. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard your work described like that, but I, I'll throw that across to you and say, what do you think of that? I think you're, you're absolutely right. And I like how you put that. Um, so I, I reverted about 27 years ago. I mean, reversion just meaning I was about to jump ship for a Bible church because I was poorly catechized in the 70s and 80s, like the rest of Generation X, you know. Um, uh, and so when I came into the church, it was just so profoundly beautiful to me to realize that this was real, you know, this, wow, you know, this, I just, I fell in love. And so, um, and my husband who was Jewish, you know, he became a convert and, uh, he was baptized on my 30th birthday. I was his RCIA teacher by that time. We had three kids already. So we've just kind of been pinching ourselves for the last you know, few decades, but I didn't start to, so I have been teaching for all that time too, but I, I, and a lot on marriage and a lot on the church's teaching on human sexuality, morality, but I didn't really touch on the whole concept of, uh, you know, divorce and what that does, um, or difficult marriages. And I think what happens is, and, and that just blew my whole, you know, I, I, my life has changed in the last six or seven years because of that, a whole other world kind of opened up to me and understanding what's going on. Um, when we deviate from God's beautiful, uh, ordered plan and the order of creation. But I think what's happening in this culture is that we see we're very comfortable. I mean, we've been comfortable in, in America, in the West. And so uh, we've been kind of conditioned not to 
want or uh, really to reject any suffering or any any time that the cross might come into our lives we we tend to think oh well that means that it's bad you know something is just really wrong and so therefore my job is to get away from the cross i have to throw the cross off my shoulders and run in the direction of comfort and um and pleasure again and happiness you know kind of this earthly happiness and so we have kind of forgotten who we are as Catholics and, and the whole concept of the cross not being necessarily just purely evil where we have to avoid it because really the cross is what Jesus has invited us into with him. You know, the mystery of suffering, um, it was the mystery of redemption, right? That's how he saved us. That's how he redeemed us was by undergoing the effects of, of evil sometimes and carrying that cross with him. And then our redemption lies through that journey on the other side of that uh, embracing of, of certain crosses. But, but we somehow have forgotten that just because we're given a cross to carry sometimes, which might mean some suffering, because of course, what is, what is sacrifice other than a giving over of your own will, a giving over of yourself, that's going to hurt at certain points because we want what we want and the world says we want you just need whatever you want you just need to take it you just whatever you desire is good but that isn't right that isn't that isn't what is good and beautiful what is good and beautiful is god's will and sometimes that entails carrying a cross for christ and with christ and uh next to christ and for other people so uh so yeah what is true and good and beautiful we've sort of distorted a little bit in the west because we think that it means feeling feeling good feeling good all the time and that's just not true yeah Layla, yeah you're saying i mean i am like sitting on my hands here like you just said so many things that i find so uh true and relevant um, I think that uh, if you listen to talks uh, to to men these days, uh, sort of men's conferences and a lot of sort of men's media that you can find on the internet, there is uh, a, a, a restored prominence to the idea that men have fallen into effeminacy. I don't know, have you heard or bumped into that at all? And not not being feminine, but effeminate, which is uh, an unwillingness to embrace the bonum arduum, the difficult good. And uh, because of uh, an over-attachment to softness and pleasure and ease. And it's something that honestly, I had to uh, experience a kind of conversion around. And, and I'll talk about this as a father. So raising my kids, one of the things that I felt and sensed was my call to protect my kids kind of provide a covering over them was to protect them from the harshness of the world. And that was a good thing. And so to keep them comfortable, to keep them safe, to keep them experiencing sort of the, the, the pleasantries of life, that was me being a good provider. And, and, and I had to recover a, a Catholic sense of saying, and this is an Aquinas, what is, what is it that turns a boy into a man? What turns a boy into a man is the bonum arduum, the difficult good a good that will only be realized when it's pursued with persistence and with sacrifice and a willingness to give of themselves in a way that says, this isn't pleasant, easy, comfortable, or fun, but it's worth choosing. It's worth pursuing. It's worth making real. And so I, I really had to, in my own way, repent and say, I'm not being a good father if I'm raising my kids in a way that is holding them back from experiencing difficult goods. But instead now it's like, okay, let me find the difficult goods to throw my kids into, to say, go pursue this. And, and it's, a, it's a really powerful way of getting them to experience dying to self, dying to ease and pleasure and comfort and, and, and embracing a cross that's, that's noble and worthy and, and in fact, is going to set them free to become truly godly young men. So uh, honestly, it's something that was never taught to me. It was never taught to me. I, I've studied a ton of theology. I've gone through all these years of, of training, five years in the seminary, wasn't ordained, and then all these other years studying uh, theology, getting this PhD, and, and then all these years of church work. No one ever taught me this. 
No one ever taught me this at all. I only discovered it, stumbled into it about five years ago. And it was like, wait a minute. Wait, what was I? Why was I robbed? Why was I held back from uh, being given the, this critical uh, gold that is there in our tradition, that is there in our church's teaching? And, and now what have I got to do? I've got to relearn what it means to be a husband and a father in the light of some fundamental insights. You are speaking my language, Tom. <laughs> I, <laughs> I cannot tell you, it, 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 you know, it's so, the, I, I have so much to say on that because you are exactly right. The, uh, and being robbed, the idea that we were robbed out of very basic, fundamental, essential truths of our faith. I always say the, you know, the truth, the, the truth and our, our faith is not brain surgery. It is just these gold nuggets of truth. You know, it's like when Christ spoke, he didn't speak in word salads and all these high, highfalutin gobbledygook psychobabble. He said things very clearly. And when you're talking about men, right, men and, and, you know, the patriarchy, which is not bad, it is actually God ordained the way it's ordained. I mean, we could go into that for a million years. I'm not you know, I'm not talking about brutish men beating women. That's not the patriarchy. But the idea that men have to take the lead, they have to be men, they have to sacrifice everything for the good, right? For their wives and their children and for society and uh, first and foremost for God. Um, but that idea of this, you know, we've we've taught our boys, especially, but our girls too, that's a whole other issue, um, to be soft, you know, and, and not to do the hard good, right. The, the thing that they're supposed to do, which will make them masculine in, in, in the way they're supposed to be. And that can, uh, it's it just so much good comes from that. And yet we have, um, what we've done is we've decided that our children, this again, is cultural. It's kind of, we, we're swimming in this cultural soup. We don't even know it. But the culture has decided that we should make sure that our children never feel a negative emotion. And, and that was like a light bulb for me when I, when I recognized that, I'm like, wait a minute. And it is, it's kind of these watershed moments where you realize, where have I been? Why have I seen everything one way? And now finally I'm seeing the light, you know, so to speak. Our job isn't to make sure that our children don't ever feel a negative emotion. Th then you, you end up with these weak, effeminate men and these spoiled brat type, you know, children who grow up to be adults who cannot handle anything, any kind of adversity in their lives or, or being told no, or being told you need to work hard. And, and we're seeing that now, I mean, generationally. Um, and again, I'm not blaming the millennials or Gen Z. We raised them, right? I mean, there's a lot of people, the boomers, the Gen X, we raised them to not feel these negative emotions. And then what do we expect that we're going to get back? So our faith calls us to actually something difficult, right? Something that's going to hurt a little bit. Like you said, it's something that brings us to a higher, uh, a higher place, a higher good. And so um, instead of challenging someone to the, um, the um, higher good, we, we just, we, we coddle them. And so it becomes kind of disastrous. So I'm, I'm with you. Let's dive into this some more. Again, I'm talking with Layla Miller, and you can see if you're watching the video version of this, you can see her website, laylamiller.net, L-E-I-L-A, laylamiller.net, for those of you that are listening to the podcast or listening on the radio. And there you'll see a number of books. And I had the, the, the pleasure of interviewing you about six or seven years ago on Raising Chaste Catholic Men, Layla. And I also got your book, Made This Way, which is, again, a fascinating and important read. And today I, I wanted to talk to you about two of your newer books, Primal Lost. Well, that's a kind of a, I don't want to call it, I don't want to call it a classic, but in that book, you bring out incredibly just, wow, uh, life-changing kind of testimonies from children who have gone through divorce and now as adults are coming and telling their testimonies. And then Impossible Marriage is Redeemed is another book that uh, there's so much that I want to cover with you. And then there are these other books that you're, you're going to be writing about other themes, including marriage prep and dealing with annulment tribunals and um, uh, another one on accessing the sacraments. Uh, so the, you're covering so much in, in a format that is um, also really unique when you ask people to give short 
testimonies of their own experience to help provide insight into things. So folks, I'm going to encourage you more than once in the course of this interview to go to Layla Miller's website, laylamiller.net, check out her books and um, find out other things that there are there to be discovered as well as a blog and, and other resources. Layla, I want to come back around to the conditions of discipleship, right? Mark chapter eight, like this is what we're talking about. Jesus summons the crowd with his disciples and says, whoever wishes to come after me must, not might sometimes occasionally, but must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose, whoever loses his life, loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. What profit is there to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? What could one give in exchange for his life? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this faithless and sinful generation, the son of man will be ashamed of when he comes in his father's glory with his holy angels. I think you should put this on the inside cover of all of your books. <laughs> I you mean, know, it really that is exactly that we, I was just thinking in my head, I'm like, I'm going to post that on Facebook as soon as I'm done with this interview. I mean, that is just obviously our faith that that is what we don't want to hear. And in my impossible marriages redeemed book, I actually uh, included a paragraph from the imitation of Christ, which was about trying to avoid the cross. And, you know, basically he says, you can try to avoid the cross your whole life, but it's going to be there anyway. It's going to follow you. So you can either basically accept it um, or it's going to still come after you. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's so true if we, if we realize that the cross is central to who we are as Christians and we cannot forget that and think that our life is one of comfort and, and, uh, and, and happiness, you know, here on this earth. It's, it's not, that, that's promised in the next life. Yep. Well, and, and boy, now, now I want to bring up um, Matthew chapter five and the Beatitudes, which is divine happiness on earth is very different than human happiness, right? Divine happiness involves that whole idea of being willing even to be persecuted falsely, right? Um, in, in, the, in the pursuit of Christ and, and being someone who stands for Christ. Uh, Layla, I want to dive into this. I want to unfold this, uh, the, some of these themes around the cross. So just as a, like a little testimony, um, so I've given talks on marriage for almost 30 years, and I used to give great talks. The best talks I ever gave on raising teens, I gave before I had any. Oh, I was amazing. The insights I had and telling these parents how to raise their teenagers when I had all these little kids, and they would come up to me and pat me on the head, and they're like, just you wait. And I'm like, oh, you just don't understand. You're not raising your kids right because, you know, things would turn out so well for you if you just followed my amazing wisdom. <laughs> now having five teenagers uh, and have had five teenagers for a number of years, uh, I'm like, where's the handbook? Where is this handbook? Because I, it, it, uh, we have experienced crosses in our lives that we never anticipated and never dreamed of, never signed up for, but they came to us. And, and here's what I want to say, and I'm going to then throw it back to you. And it's this, is that one of the greatest gifts that God ever gave our marriage, Carrie and my marriage, was the heaviest cross we ever had to bear when it came to parenting one of our teenage daughters who didn't fall off the deep end, jumped off the deep end. And it, it brought Carrie and me to our knees at a places of desperation where we cried out to the Lord because we did not have the answers. And what we had established as our way of parenting, um, what we came to call the connector and the corrector. So I was the connector and she was the corrector. It stopped working. It wasn't working. And I had to step up into a, a way of being father to this daughter that was so challenging to me. I It was so against the grain of all of the years of how we had parented to that point and it had worked and it stopped working. And it was such a cross and a trial for my family, but thank God for it. I thank Jesus for that cross because it brought us to a new level of parenting and being together as as a married couple that has been such an advance and such a gift in our married life that we would not have known had that cross not come to us. 
Yes, I will just want to echo that. Yes, th this is exactly right. And people won't know this when they're younger. Usually you don't know this until you go through a lot of these trials because I was the same way, which was, well, you know, I have a certain way. I know, I know what I'm teaching. I know, I know how these kids are going to turn out. I know everything about, you know, these children that I'm with day in and day out. And um, yeah, we just kind of went through life and everything was great. I always tell people, um, the parenting difficulty, the, the most pain there is in parenting is when your children are already grown. And so, cause at least, you know, and, and teenagers too can be obviously very, very difficult, but as long as they're in your home and they're around you and you're, you know, you're kind of doing what you think you need to do and what God is asking. And, um, but then you're, you're kind of feeling in control or safe in, in a way. Um, but then there's the loss of control when they get bigger, they have their own free will, right? Um, things don't go according to a script. The danger is always that a good Catholic couple or good Catholic parent is going to uh, see these um, traps or these, um, like you said, someone jumping jumping off into you know, into a pit or into off a cliff, and they're going to, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> got my water. Hang on. And they're going to um, jump with the child into the pit or start becoming at odds with the, the other parent or that that's going to, that there's a potential to blow up the family. Mm -hmm. If everybody, you know, if, if cooler heads do not prevail, if Christ is not given pride of place, if we do not give up our wills and say, I'm not in control, Lord, I'm going to detach, I'm going to surrender, but I'm also not going to give up my faith or my truth, um, the truth for a child who might be going crazy. This is the time to become more prayerful, uh, to become, you know, access the sacraments more often. Um, <clears throat> you know, as our kids get, get off into the world, it's more about, I've started to go to daily mass. I've started, you know, the, the daily rosary. Now we have a family rosary with the kids that are still at home, which we never did previously. Um, you know, a weekly holy hour, the, the mental prayer that we have to have, the uh, diving into the words of the saints and the scripture, we have all this now that we do more often than we did when they were small. And it's because you realize we're not in control. We're not in control of other people. We, we can't, we can only control our own will. So uh, it's actually been beautiful. I'm, I'm like you, it's, it's uh, and, and the fruit has been amazing. Um, I, I don't say this with any, um, it's not, I, I can say that none of my kids have left the faith and, and there, there's a great blessing in that. Half of my kids are grown um, and we have many grandchildren in it, and it's been wonderful, but there is a lot of treachery out there and it's still, you realize, I, I tell my friends all the time who have older kids now, I now understand that icon, that iconic image of the Catholic grandmother who is more uh, prayerful and who sits there with her rosary beads and you know, used to be like, oh yeah, okay, that's that's cute. And what's, I mean, I guess that's just this funny thing that old grandmas used to do. I completely understand that now. And I don't think you can understand that when you're a young mother, an, a young parent, but that is who you need to become. That's who you're supposed to become. And the trials of life and the all the, the sufferings of your children lead you there. And it's supposed to be that way. That's how it works. Yeah. You know, Layla, I think of, uh, I actually think of my mother-in-law. She's going to hear this, but uh, one of the things that Carrie says about her mom, she's the a mom of 12 kiddos and she's, uh, she's over 90 and she is in a painful place. So she suffers every day. Right. But Carrie's insight is she doesn't want to die. She would rather suffer on behalf of her kids and her grandchildren and her great grandchildren, so that they would be redeemed from broken, dark situations, preserved in the faith, and help advance along the way of holiness. She would rather suffer for their redemption and sanctification than go home to heaven and be done with suffering. It's a really powerful example, right? It's easy to think, oh, it's it's so quaint to pray a rosary as a, as an older person. No, they're suffering in an interior way that is causing so much spiritual good to be poured forth upon and, and, and take root in and come to birth in their children and grandchildren and, and for the sake of their kids' marriages and, you know, grandkids' marriages and on and on. It's like, 
we won't, we will only see that in the end. It'll only be revealed in the end, just the, 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 the redemptive power of suffering. It's not just a devotional idea. It is, it is where cross and resurrection come alive in, in family life. And so I think you're so right on when you talk about that. Um, I, I say, Layla, um, it's passivity. It is, um, avoidance and it is, um, uh, distraction. I think that those are the great enemies of men and women standing up as husbands and wives or standing up as faithful Catholics today to address some burning issues. And so I want to get to your book on primal loss and, and I want to talk about standards um, because these are key themes. Again, I'm talking to Layla Miller today and, and I please encourage you to go to her website, laylamiller.net. I'm going to, again, share that website so that you can um, get to her website. You can get access to her wonderful materials. Uh, she's a Catholic author and has a beautiful blog and, and does lots of appearances uh, in uh, podcasts and posts regularly on, on social media like Facebook. Um, lots and lots of stuff around what Sister Lucia told some cardinal, I don't remember who it was, uh, that the devil's uh, final confrontation against the church is going to be coming after the family. Uh, you're probably familiar with that, uh, that insight that she shared. And uh, I mean, are you, it, it, where's the devil attacking more, but coming against marriage and family today, you know, it just, it, it feels like they're under attack in a hundred different ways. Every single angle, whether it's the cultural angle of just saying, you know, marriage doesn't really exist anymore. Cause once you've said it's not even you know, marriage has about three different really essential components. And that is um, that it's it's procreative, uh, it's permanent, and uh, it's male and female, it's conjugal. So those have been thrown out the window in the culture. So now we have, you know, these kids coming up who will never know. There are many children who will never know that that's what marriage is, except, you know, somewhere in like a, 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 a memory, an echo of a memory in their soul. I mean, but they don't even know. They don't see it. They don't see it on TV anymore. They don't see it in the movies. They don't see it. In... And then we have a church that is largely silent on so much of this. You know, you could go um, to mass every week for your whole life. And I do know that like once, once uh, in my, I was 50 at the time I started my work on divorce. And it was that year. It was the first time I heard a homily on the evils of divorce. That was it. The first time. And yet um, it's explicit in scripture. Jesus says it, St. Saint Saint Paul says it. Um, we've got tons of teachings of the popes and but it's not talked about. So, we, so we've got that. And even the catechism has really strong words on, on that, the evils of divorce, but we don't talk about it. So, okay. So we divorce at the same rate as everybody else and as Catholics. And um, we're, we're against divorce in theory, but we're not against divorce in practice. And so hey, there you go. Let's talk about this. I got to... What you just said is so striking and it's true and it's it's tragic that remember what is true is also good and beautiful. So somehow the church is teaching on marriage, it's indissoluble, it's for life, right? It's for a man and a woman. It's supposed to be open to life. Just saying that it's it's um it's it's indissoluble, it's it's meant for life, and that therefore no fault divorce is an evil. I, I don't know if I've ever heard that said in a homily ever. And I think that there's a reason why it, it's uncomfortable, right? There's that sense of, okay, well, what are you going to do? If the, there are people in my congregation that that are in second marriages, in, in third marriages, and there are kids here, and, and, and therefore, we can't mention this teaching. We shouldn't mention this teaching. It, it's going to be too uncomfortable for some people and family situations, and therefore, we we don't say anything about it. And and an evil is allowed to be spread further, and it, it's such a it's such a terrible terrible thing to not have that said. And in your book, Primal Loss, you expose. I think really, I'm not sure I've ever seen it before in another book. The the testimonies and stories of kids who have grown up in that generation of no fault divorce. Talk about what what was uh, maybe the most striking thing that, that came out of, of those testimonies that you lay out in chapter after chapter, the different impacts of 
of the, the loss and suffering of, of now adults that, that grew up in families that experienced divorce. Well, so and it's been about six years, I think, since it was published. It still has attraction. Like people are still, I get emails every week. I get people coming to me all the time about this because the striking thing was, first of all, when it came to me to do this, and I won't even get into all that, but I was 50 years old and I divorce was not a part of my life. I, I, my parents were married for 54 years before my father died. I, I'm certainly not divorced. I mean, I, people in my immediate family, nobody's divorced. Um, so this was new. This was new. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Well, I wonder. And then I started reading, you know, I put this questionnaire out there. I started reading and I, I, I feel like, you know, I was Pollyanna before that. And I don't know how I walked around for 50 years, not seeing the walking wounded all around me. And, and now I'm beginning to, you know, as I'm reading that, I'm like, okay, uh, I wanted to almost do penance. Like how, how did I not know that we, there are people living in two different types of worlds. And uh, the, the thing that struck me most aside from the similarities of the responses, no matter if they were male, female, old, old adult, older adults, younger adults, um, bad, messy divorce or really good divorce, you know, we're gonna do everything right by our children as we amicably divorce. It didn't really matter because the results, the answers um, and experiences were so similar. And I would have some contributors, they're all anonymous, but I would have some of these contributors, the ones that finally could bring themselves to actually read the book. Uh, they would be reading, they'd tell me, and they'd see a paragraph and say, oh, oh, here's my entry. Here's, here's part of what I said. And they'd get to the little contributor number and they'd say, that's not me. Wait, that's not me. And they couldn't believe how similar these responses were. The tragedy in all this, as far as I'm concerned, is the silence around it, because if you have millions of people who have experienced this and none of them understands or knows that other people have experienced the same thing, then they think they're crazy because they've been told, well, everything is so good. Your parents are, are, are wise, you know, they, they, they're happy now and everybody's better off. And, you know, um, you're happy when your parents are happy and the kids are resilient and all these lies that we tell. And uh, once I was, let's I was go on into the, those. We want to go in. I want to go into those because when you read the testimonies, you start with that first big lie, which is mommy and daddy are not happy. Mm -hmm. And if mommy and daddy end this relationship and they and daddy leaves the house, he's going to mm -hmm. be happier. And that's going to make mommy happier because they're not going to fight anymore. And Excellent. you know what? That's going to lead to a more comfortable, peaceful environment for you kids. So this is going to be better for you. I think that's the number one lie. Right. And I want to get the big elephant in the room out of the way right here to say if there is danger and abuse and serious, you know, um, I think that the canon law says uh, grave uh, mental and physical danger. The church permits physical separation. Okay. That's okay. Nobody's saying stay and get pummeled to death. Right. So please let's, but let's not put the mute button on the majority of these divorces. So let's talk about that. Uh, you know, oh yeah, you're going to be happier. Okay. Well, that actually doesn't end up happening. Yes. There may be an initial relief, maybe sometimes for the fighting to stop, let's say, but in a lot of cases there really isn't overt fighting anyway. That's another myth. Some of these are very low. Most divorces are not high conflict divorces. Most are just low conflict divorces. I'm not happy anymore. We've grown apart. You annoy me, you know, that type of thing. Um, okay, hold on. That's true. As that is true. Low conflict is the majority of, because again, no fault divorce means there's nobody at fault back before no fault divorce, which is purely evil you would have to have a fault. Somebody would have to be, um, you know, an, an addict who wasn't, you know, who's le leaving the family homeless or a, a serial adulterer or, uh, you know, all the abuse, you know, all this stuff, you'd have to have a fault there, but there's no fault. Nobody's at fault. We just, we just destroy families. We're not just destroying a relationship between um, two adults, which is unfortunately what the culture believes marriage is. It's about a romance between two adults. No. Marriage exists for children. That's why marriage exists. It's for the procreation and, and formation education of children. So hold on, that is so shocking. I mean, that is so coming. I know, from right? Mouth. Wait a minute. This isn't about me. This isn't about my <laughs> happiness about and my goodness, right? 
Well, and, and here's the thing, kids see it, right? So one of the things is that kids will recognize when uh, mom or dad are living for themselves versus living for others. And that's living for the sake of the family. For the, are they sacrificing? Is, is this a sense of, uh, you know, donation, right? That idea of love is self-gift. I'm going to give myself as a gift. And if that is operating in a, in a in a home, then all of a sudden, low conflict is just picking up my cross. You know, it's it's dad being dad and mom being mom and nobody's perfect. And you know what? Somehow this is going to lead to my purification and sanctification. And you're going to get me a higher place in heaven. Thank you for that, honey. You're making me a saint. And I'm going to make you a saint too. And let's let's continue to, to grow together, right? What, how is that not a, a vision for marriage that ought to be promoted, right? Oh, because it's not about romance anymore. It's not about a feeling in your <laughs> stomach that you feel like butterflies and that, you know, that's what marriage is, right? It's a romantic contract. It's not about forming a family for the stability of the children that come from that union and for, which feeds over into society. Again, read what the catechism has to say about divorce. It talks about all of that. Like this is, this is, it introduces chaos into society um, as well as into families. It, it, it traumatizes, it has the word in the catechism. It traumatizes children and abandoned spouses. And so, uh, but we don't okay, care. Anymore. Now you just used another phrase, abandoned spouses. That's yeah. something that, again, is finally coming out into use. It's another one of these words or phrases that I never saw before, uh, never learned about in all my understanding of church teaching and, and preparation for marriage and all this other stuff. The, the phrase abandoned spouse yeah. is something that, again, when I think about one of the effects of divorce is Often, I don't know, statistically, you if you're aware of it, is it more often that the wife or the husband is doing the abandoning and who's the abandoned? I presume it's the the, the wife that is abandoned more often and is left no. raising the children. Well, <laughs> there's a lot that's changed. Uh, well, I think now about 70% of divorce is initiated by the woman. So there are a lot more abandoned men. Um, and that has a lot to do with feminism. It has a lot to do with a lot of different things. Um, but uh the idea is, well, I gosh, that's a whole other topic, but yes. So 70% now are women. Um, and, uh, yeah, as far as well, who gets uh, let me say it this way, like a lot of times I'll, I'll come into contact in, in a church setting, right? We have a lot of, let's say intentional Catholics living their faith and then, oh, there's that family where there's that woman who's divorced and there's a, it's kind of a pariah. There's a kind of a stigma. There's kind of a, oh, I wonder how they failed. And mm -hmm. it's something that clings to the woman that she has failed. And here mm -hmm. she is trying to carry a heavier burden, raising a family by herself when she is the victim. She's been abandoned and she's trying to carry now this heavy burden in way more complicated circumstances where the husband is off with his new spouse and wants to win the favor of the kids and is going to introduce a whole different set of values and, and lifestyle choices. And, you know, it's just, it, this just ball just keeps unwinding. And it's like, holy cow, what, what, what are we doing for, for that woman? I, and I know I've departed now from primal loss a bit, but it, it it's like there's another talk about big elephant in the room at, at least that's my experience i don't know if i'm wrong there well you know you're not wrong and it's funny because i know one abandoned spouse and to, in, in my experience i get i get the emails from the men and the women who are abandoned it's a terrible it is a terrible plight um but the innocent ones um who never wanted a divorce who are not guilty of some great abuse or you know some horrible thing they are left um, they are seen, like you said, is kind of suspect, you know, what's, what's going on there. Um, they don't get a lot of support from the church, you know, from the parishes necessarily. Uh, they do become a little bit like pariahs. So there's a lot of loneliness and isolation there, especially if they're standing for their vow and they're going to be one that wants to stay faithful like Christ to the end, right? That we, he had the ultimate, he was the ultimate abandoned spouse. So, um, yeah, you have this uh, lack of support, a lack of understanding. And again, you go back to the, even the catechism says, 
the, these are innocent victims of divorce. You know, these are the ones who we need to support. J John Paul II in his Familiaris Consortio says, I think it's paragraph uh, 20 or, and then 80, 83 and 85, talks about support and that these, these abandoned spouses who remain faithful and don't move on to their next romance, right? Because that's not good for kids either. I mean, moving on to the next romance, that's a whole other topic we could discuss. But they um, should be held up as witnesses. That's what JP2 said, held up as witnesses who need to be supported. And instead, what we do, unfortunately, is we shame them or we pat them on the head and like, well, you know what? He left. He's 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 moved on. You need to go find a boyfriend, you know, or you need to go find a girlfriend if it's the guy or why are you why are you doing this? You know, there's something wrong with you, something wrong with you. The other person has moved on and and, and seemingly has been supported in that, unfortunately, by a lot of different uh, Catholics as well. But uh, because, again, if a marriage didn't work out, why would they stay? I mean, why stay happy? You know, go and go and be happy. Go do the self-fulfillment thing. So it's, it, it adds to the burden of the one who is doing the witnessing of Christian life. Beautiful, beautiful fidelity. That is beautiful for the children to see. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I've noticed in my work, the, the kids who do the best are when at least one parent is not going to move on to the next romance, but is going to stay faithful. That's when the kids, you see fruit in those children. You don't see as much devastation. You see um, even vocations coming out of those. I've seen priests come out of those types of situations. Well, wow, that's really striking. I'm talking again with Layla Miller. Uh, Layla is someone who has just been led into uh, a whole world of where the devil is is attacking the most in the church today in marriage and family life. And uh, we, we just touched upon primal loss, which it really talks about stories and testimonies of, of the impact of divorce on kids now that they're adults and reflecting back and sharing those stories um, Layla, also, um, you recently put out uh, a post on uh, Catholic Answers uh, website and, and made it on, on a way to Facebook and had all of these different responses to it about standards. And you referenced them uh, just a minute ago about um, the, the spouse who was abandoned stands faithful and stays true to their marriage vow that even though they've been abandoned, they will not leave and, 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 and betray their own sacramental marriage and they'll stay true and they get blamed, they get shamed. And in, in some ways, what it's a, it's one of those prophetic stands. That's a bother. Like, okay, you're now, you're pricking our conscience here. And I wish you would just, you know, go away and stop yes. bothering us because you're raising a specter that it's really yes. too painful for us to think about the implications if we don't, it's a lot easier to, to go to their new engagement party and to go to that wedding, uh, the second wedding. And we just want to, we want to go along and get along again. It's that passivity, that unwillingness to, 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 uh, bring up a, a place of conflict. Um, and, and, uh, and instead, um, stand for the truth that no, it's actually good and beautiful to do this because we don't want to have those further impacts on the lives of the kids or even betray the call that God has for our own lives. You nailed it when you said it's pricking the conscience because we are uncomfortable with someone who would make that big of a sacrifice to risk being alone and lonely without romance for the rest of their lives. I mean, that is so abhorrent to our modern sensibilities that we have to put the pathology on them, right? Like there's something wrong with this person. Go, you know, go. we, we don't wanna, you know, we're gonna either patronize you or we're going to shame you or we're going to ignore you or we're going to put all sorts of um, motives on you that, because who would just do that? Who would do something that would make their lives uncomfortable and lonely for indefinite amount of time, you know, even for the rest of their lives. We don't want to know that that is a possibility for even us or that we might be called to that someday because there's no way most of us are going to do that. So it is, it is a, it is a matter of pricking the conscience and it is a shame because it puts again, more of a burden on these souls who are trying to do the right thing. Um, 
again, their crown, maybe it's, maybe it's better to heap it on them and their crown is going to be even bigger, you know, in heaven and their, their joy. But, uh, but we need to be aware of it. Cause again, I think it's a lot of times, it's just a matter of that. We're just not aware. So like you said about the effeminacy, it, sometimes there's just that light bulb moment where we're like, I, I had people, um, in, in re response to that article say that they had never thought of it. They'd never heard of this before. And I'm thinking, well, uh, for, uh, part of me is like, well, how could you not hear this? And then I realized, well, okay, but I've been doing this work for six years. What about prior to that six years? I never thought about it either. Yep. So I have to kind of remember, it wasn't on my radar either. It wasn't on my radar screen. We didn't know, I, I didn't know. And, and I have a lot of that even about the children of divorce. Well, I didn't know. And so I, I, again, you know, I want to make other people understand because people of goodwill, once they do hear, they will suddenly be on that, um, on the right side of this issue and start to really, um, you know, speak clearly on these truths. And, and we need that. We just need more people of goodwill to understand. So Layla, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, we're coming close to the end of the interview, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the things that's going to move people is in fact suffering. Um, when Carrie and I, we talk about people that we encounter regularly in church settings uh, that are facing um, a trial or a difficulty, whether it's a, a wayward child or whether it's a, a difficult family circumstance. And it's a matter of saying, what are you going to do? There's throw your hands up with a sense of powerlessness and passivity versus, well, here's what you can do. You can speak into this situation. You can stand for what is truly good and beautiful in the church's teaching, whether it's there's a gay partner or whether it is someone, a couple living together or whether it is um, celebrating the second marriage of someone who's abandoned their spouse uh, or betraying their, right? In, in, in these main big chunky things, it's a matter of saying, I will take a stand for what is the truth revealed by God and I'll suffer for it rather than just compromise my fundamental beliefs and what I uh, have, what I believe, in fact, is, is the truth of God in this matter. And I'll be a prophetic witness, even if that means that I'm going to be persecuted as the bad guy. And it's, we're not, we have that horror of suffering. It comes back to that. We're unwilling to pick up a cross that we can easily avoid by just going and watch the next uh, series on Netflix that comes up and just binge binge watch that instead of taking more pro prophetic, courageous action and standing for the truth and for standing for those who are even unwilling to stand for the truth. Amen. Well said. And if we don't, if we don't work those muscles and um, exercise those muscles of courage, against even social shaming, which is what, what it comes down to, um, then how will we witness this for our children? How will we model this for them, our children who are coming up in a time when it's going to get really difficult, right? If they have not, if they have not seen us stand up um, in an unpopular situation, then how will they ever, how can we expect them to do it? Yep. So I'm going to end with this, uh, there's something that my daughter wrote to me, this wayward daughter that I had to fundamentally be ground down and stand up in a whole new way as a dad. She wrote me in a letter. She said, dad, thank you for loving me enough to not get away with things that you know are not good for me. Thank you for loving me enough to not let me get away with things that you know are not good for me. And that was so powerful um, to receive that from her and, uh, you know, whatever it was inside of her that allowed her to, to, to bring up that kind of, uh, insight. I think that's, that's what we need. We need men and women today to love family members and, and fellow parishioners and, and uh, fellow travelers in this world. We need to love this society enough to not let it get away with things that we know by the gift of God and the grace of God in our faith that we know are not good for them. I couldn't have said it any better. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right. That's Layla Miller. Please again, go to her website, laylamiller.net. 
Lila, I need to have you on for like a part two where we can talk about can practical talk stuff. <laughs> yeah, I know. We yeah. got through the introductory point that I had. That was about all we got through, Layla. <laughs> right. All right. That's Layla Miller. And uh, Layla, thank you so much for being with me today on the program. Thank you, Tom. God bless you.